medicine at Ames Nagpur. Uh, and before this, Saur has held uh, key positions as the professor and head of medicine at IGGMC Nagpur, the president of the Diabetic Association of India, 2017-18 Nagpur, and the president of Academy of Medical Sciences Nagpur in 2006-07. Saur has over 37 years of experience as a medical teacher and a consulted physician has uh, extensively published, has more than 188 research publications in journals, the JAMA, the NEJM, the BMJ, the Lancet, uh, the WHO Bulletin, JACC, American Journal of Tropical Medicine, etc. Uh, Sir is the recipient of the Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship, UNC Australia, and has worked as the WHO temporary advisor and as the consultant to Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, IDSP. Uh, Sir has been the principal investigator of uh, funded research projects of WHO and ICMR, and some very notable projects include the Interheart Study, Interstroke, InterCHF, the WHO Indian Industrial Study, the Indian Migration Study, the CREATE Study, the Advanced Trial, and the India B Study. Uh, Sir has guided uh, 42 PG students and nine UG STS scholars from the ICMR and uh, has been awarded with the COVID Warrior Award by the Honorable Governor of Maharashtra and by the IMA. Uh, so it has also worked on the editorial boards of numerous journals, such as the Indian Heart Journal, the JAPI, Associate Editor of the uh, Global Heart, and the Section Editor Journal of uh, Clinical Epidemiology and Global Health. Uh, also, so it has written a chapter on trypanosomiasis in the API textbook of medicine and described the first case of human trypanosomiasis in the world due to T events. I, uh, I, am, I welcome Sir and we are truly honored to have um, a, a researcher of his stat, a stature uh, with us here today to lend uh, to share his expertise on the topic. And so we are so grateful that you could join us here today. Uh, and of course, uh, we are very grateful to have you here because also your credentials in epidemiology are quite notable, uh, apart from medicine as well, sir. So I welcome you, sir. sir thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would like to thank right at the outset, uh, uh, ILBS and uh, Ames also Nagpur for giving me this opportunity to speak here on a diagnosis of uh, this important topic of NFLD at different levels of healthcare. And uh, we know the last few decades, India has been experiencing an escalating epidemic of cardiovascular disease, non-communicable diseases, obesity, and uh, uh, and coronary artery disease in India, and uh, of which now uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a part of that spectrum. And uh, if this uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-communicable disease are essentially driven by lifestyle changes and by the lifestyle transition which has occurred uh, in our uh, lifestyle in the last few decades by adoption, adoption of uh, various unhealthy risk behaviors and adopting a sedentary lifestyle, which ultimately, and consumption of a diet which is rich in calories and a nutrition transition, uh, which ultimately culminates into uh, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, and dyslipidemia, which are basically components of the metabolic syndrome and the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which cause cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases. Uh, because of uh, urbanization and overpowering globalization and the consumption of diet, which is essentially rich in fat, and uh, consumption of uh, inex excessive use of inexpensive tobacco, are all responsible for this escalating epidemic and accelerating epidemic which India is experiencing. We know the childhood obesity and adolescent obesity is also on the rise in India, especially in urban areas. And uh, we have we also know that childhood adolescent obesity is a forerunner of adult obesity, which can cause adult non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uh, which is basically because of adoption of the culture of poco colonization and McDonaldization by our younger generation. Now, why Indians are more prone to develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, diabetes and insulin resistance and premature coronary artery disease is essentially because of the 
or Asian Indian phenotype, which is characterized by a typical body composition, which is unique to the Indians, which is called thin fat phenotype or sarcopenic obesity. So for a, for a given BMI, Asian Indians, which means we, we all have a higher percentage of body fat, have higher central obesity, have higher waist circumference and a greater insulin resistance and probably a higher level of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this study, again, the entire results of this study, which shows nearly one third of our population are obese, and it is abdominal obesity, which is predominant in Asians than uh, BMI. The physical activity is dismally poor. And this study, a diet study, actually showed that more than 90% of Indians had no recreational physical activity. And these two things are very important. And we are also have the dubious distinction of having a large number of diabetics in India, all this predisposing to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, why is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease important? Not only because it is quite highly prevalent and nearly about one third of the, uh, one quarter of the uh, population has this problem. And it is also a common cause of asymptomatic liver enzymes elevations and is now considered to be a leading cause of cirrhosis of liver. And uh, it also is responsible for increase in mortality, uh, overall mortality uh, in patients who have NFAID, when not mortality, not due to NFAID, but because of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease or because of heart attacks or paralytic strokes or cancers. And death is cardiac, is first death, cause of death in you know, patients who have NFAID, followed by liver problems and then cancers. So it's also third most common cause of uh, hepatocellular cancer in the US. So NFAID is an important proposition and therefore cannot be ignored. And it, continuing with some epidemiology, it's a leading emerging common cause of liver disease, not only globally, but also in India. And a quarter of the Asian adult population has been found to have this problem. Now, by definition, it is a it is a basically a silent epidemic because uh, because of, because NFLD basically produces no symptoms, and it is correct defined. Uh, uh, this definition basically is a negative definition, which means that there is an excessive collection of fat, uh, more than five percent of body weight in the liver uh, of the liver, and uh, we need to exclude certain uh, alcohol consumption, medications, and other disorders which are responsible for uh, liver fat. So it's basically a negative definition. And uh, therefore, a new definition of NFAID has come up to which Dr. Sarin has referred in his talk, previous talk. It is metabolic associated fatty liver disease, which is a positive term, which is diagnosed not by exclusion, but by inclusion of metabolic factors. And this slide he showed, and I'm not going to talk about it because that's not the focus of my talk here, but it's important to understand that uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease may probably be called metabolic associated fatty liver disease in future. Then there is a distinct entity called lean NASH, which is found in 20% uh, of NASH populations. Prevalence is 5.1% in Indian to 16.4% in Italy. And it's characterized uh, by lower metabolic factors and lower steatosis, lower fibrosis, and severe lobular inflammation. A lot of genetic factors and environmental influences which are responsible for this entity. And the environmental factors are basically driven by uh, increased intake of fructose in the diet. The younger generation consumes lots of soft drinks. That is what I cement by when I said cocolonization and consumption of juices and sugars and increased intake of cholesterol in the diet. Uh, as has been alluded also previously, uh, risk factors for NFAID is important because we need to uh, understand what, need, what we need to do in the community. And it is the various components of the metabolic syndrome, which are the risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it's also very important to understand that uh, in Indians, lower cutoff levels for obesity has been, uh, have been defined. The cutoff level for BMI is not 25, but it is uh, for, uh, it is uh, more than 23 is overweight and more than 25 obesity. And even for abdominal obesity, the cutoff levels are lower 
uh, if you see the definition of metabolic syndrome, the cutoff levels for abdominal obesity is uh, waist circumference of more than 102 in males and 88 centimeters in females. But in South Asians, which means in Indians, in ours, the cutoff levels described is more than 90 centimeters in males and more than 80 centimeters in females. And why this is so is because the lower cutoff, the, the South Asians and uh, have been found to have developed metabolic complications of obesity at lower cutoff levels of obesity and therefore cutoff levels are much lower as per the South Asia specific guidelines at a lower cut, uh, uh, the cutoff levels are much lower than what has been seen for Europeans and the US population. Genetic factors therefore are also very important for development as well as for progression of NFA. And this is again a slide which is again a uh, repetition of what probably has been told earlier, uh, but when we have a healthy liver, which is, uh, and then our uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease were characterized by uh, accumulation of fat, but no hepatocellular engineering accumulation of fat causes ballooning of the uh, hepatocytes, and causes inflammation and injury, and that leads to fibrosis. Up to this point, it is reversible, and we can prevent the progression and prevent, go back to normal, uh, if you adopt a healthy lifestyle at this stage, it is possible to go back to a healthy liver. But if if uh, the same type of unhealthy lifestyle is, is continued, uh, patients would progress to a reversible stage of cirrhosis where we need to focus on prevention of complications of cirrhosis. And some of these persons who have cirrhosis would ultimately go on to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And it is even very important to note that sometimes patients with NFARD may develop a hepatocellular carcinoma directly without passing through all these three stages. And then the treatment of cirrhosis and hepatocellular uh, carcinoma would depend on liver transplantation and other aspects. So my, coming to my topic of uh, how to diagnose uh, fatty liver uh, and how at different stages of healthcare, uh, I would first focus on the various modalities by which uh, we can diagnose. And as a clinician, we have to take symptoms, but majority of patients who have fatty liver would be asymptomatic. They would be detected by an in, by a ultrasound, which is done incidentally for some other reason and a fatty liver is reported. And uh, therefore, it is called a silent epidemic. Sometimes it is the patients may have fatigue, but then fatigue is a very vague symptom and pain in the right hypochondrium can occur sometimes because stretching of the capsule of the liver because of enlargement of the liver. Now, NFLD is very commonly, in fact, detected incidentally. Many of my patients who do an ultrasound for some other reason come back with a report of a fatty liver. And uh, it's because it's a very... Uh, it's a non-invasive technique, ultrasound. It's a high sensitivity and specificity of detecting NFALD. Uh, it is in fact more sensitive than the CT scan. Ultrasound can detect uh, fatty liver much better than what a CT scan can do. But the, uh, the weaknesses, there are some weaknesses. It's operator dependent. One cannot differentiate necrosis and inflammation and fibrosis, which are not detected. And it has a low sensitivity with steatosis when uh, is less than 20% in those who are obese. But basically a very good screening technique, very cheap, easily available, widely available, and, uh, uh, and has a fairly high sensitivity of detecting NFALD. And then we also have these kind of reports uh, coming to us uh, by a radiologist from of grade one fatty liver, grade two fatty liver, grade three fatty liver, depending on the increase in fine echoes from slight, moderate to smart, and one can create the level of fatty liver based on ultrasound on grade one. But then coming back to some non-invasive tools and ways in which fibrosis, FI, which uh, NFALD, whether it has progressed to uh, fibrosis or not, is to do what is known as the fibrosis score, a FIP4 score. Fibrosis score, a very simple, uh, way or not, as, and there is an app available on the net and you can just feed in just four four parameters we need to know age the ASCLT and platelet and then we can calculate uh, what is the by this formula we can calculate what the FIP score uh, FIP4 score is and it independently helps in identifying NFALD with and without advanced fibrosis at initial NFALD diagnosis so that if you have a patient who of uh, 
uh, fatty liver, which has been incidentally detected by uh, ultrasound, we can go ahead with this simple test of doing uh, AST, ALT, and platelets, or doing simple LFT and complete blood count. And if the score is less than 1.45, there is no advanced sources. And this has a very high negative predictive value. Then we have also a very another very very commonly used score called the NFALD score, which is again a composite of age, body mass index. Here also we have similar to the FIP4, we have age platelets and ASTLT. But in addition to that, in the NFALD score, we also have BMI, we have diabetes, and we have albumins also all parts uh, are included in the NF score. And again. It, uh, it, is, uh, form, it is a well-validated uh, score where available on the net and you can put, put up these your values there and get your uh, score. And it again independently identifies NFALD patients who are with or without advanced fibrosis at initial NFALD diagnosis. So if you have a diagnosis of NFALD and uh, you can do the simple tests of LFT and simple tests of complete blood count or simple platelet count, and we can come out with this non-invasive score of NFALD and fibrosis, which have a very high negative predictive value of at a cutoff level of minus 1.45, the NFALD uh, NFS score or the NFLD fibrosis score has a negative predictive value of 0.98, whereas FIP score Four at a cutoff level of 1.3 less than that has a negative predictive value of 0.98, which means that if these patients have a score which is less than 0.14 for an NFS score or a FIP score less than 1.3, there is a very high chance that they do not have advanced fibrosis and these patients can be sent back and uh, no need to further investigate these patients. And therefore, as, as I've just mentioned, that NFLD fibrosis score or a FIP score has a high negative predictive value and it's very performs very well in excluding a Swan's fibrosis and therefore may be used confidently as a first line risk stratification to exclude severe disease and a combination of elastography to which I will go in, which I will elude to in my next few slides with these scores may do better than either alone. So a combination of elastography, that is a fibro scan, along with uh, this course, non-invasive scores, would do better than either method alone. And it also, these scores are very non-invasive, very simple, and have a possible role in monitoring response to therapy as well. Now, this is another way in which you can detect fibrosis. See, patients who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the initial stages, uh, and they may progress to NASH where the elevated enzymes may be present, liver enzymes may be present. But elevated liver enzymes, if you see in patients who have NASH as compared to other uh, hepatitis, is, are not very highly elevated. So if you have a, a CNAST or ALT about range of 800 to 1000, you are not dealing with NASH. Usually NASH, the AST, ALT levels would be less than 250. And, uh, and uh, that is NASH usually when the patients have got fatty liver going in for inflammation and therefore elevation of ASCLT. And then this patients progress to fibrosis and fibrosis is detected by that score, FIP score or NAS or NFS score. And then by a ultrasound based technology called a fibro scan, which is also called transient elastography. It helps, it detects both it detects liver stiffness, which is the measure of hepatic fibrosis. This is measured in kilo caspals. And if it is more than eight kilo caspals, there is, if it is more, if there is significant fibrosis. More important, if the, uh, if the score is less than eight kilo caspals, you have practically ruled out uh, advanced fibrosis and these patients can be then uh, referred back uh, for nothing else may be done uh, at a lower center. So then the, it also has this fibro scan, also has this controlled attenuation parameter, a software installed in it, which is highly correlated with hepatic steatosis. So it helps in, helps in detecting both fibrosis as well as hepatic steatosis. And it performs best when ruling out advanced fibrosis, which means the, uh, uh, if the score is less than eight, uh, say, if you look uh, past skills, then you have practically ruled out advanced fibrosis. This is again scores of uh, controlled attenuation uh, parameters and a, and a score of less than uh, 250 probably you are dealing, you are quite safe. And that would detect 
hepatic steatosis. So transient elastography or fibroscan is an excellent tool, uh, a non-invasive tool, which can detect both fibrosis as well as steatosis. And there is, and based on this fibroscan score, we can uh, categorize patients in from into these categories of F0 to F4, depending on the severity of the fibrosis score. Then we have CT and MRI. And unfortunately, CT is not a good tool to detect steatosis, but MRI is. Both can detect hepatic for steatosis, but MRI can quantify steatosis much better than a CT scan. But MRI is an expensive proposition and uh, more importantly, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, MRS, was a better tool to an accurate in measuring hepatic triglycerides. So it's a, it's a very good tool uh, for measuring hepatic steatosis, but unfortunately, it's, it's an expensive investigation and it cannot detect fibrosis. For detecting fibrosis, we need to do MR elastography, MRE. Um, that is magnetic resonance elastography. It can measure liver stiffness, that is liver fibrosis, with a very high sensitivity and a fairly good sensitivity. Again, the, the weakness or the disadvantage of this technique is that it is expensive and uh, may not be available in many of these centers, and it takes a long time to get an MR done. MR done. Liver biopsy is, of course, the uh, gold standard for the diagnosis of uh, NAFLD, and uh, it is recommended in only in select patients. It's an invasive procedure and therefore cannot be done to make a confirmatory diagnosis, but it's a goal considered to be the gold standard for diagnosis because it reliably and accurately quantifies the amount of fat in the liver, the amount of inflammation in the liver, and amount of liver stiffness and liver fibrosis, which is there. So liver biopsy is very important, but not possible to do it in all patients. And there are very specific indications when, when you are not sure about the diagnosis and when you are suspecting NFALD with advanced liver disease, we may go ahead with liver biopsy. The disadvantage, of course, is cost availability. It causes discomfort to the patient. It's invasive and very important. It's a, there is a error maybe there because of called the sampling error because what you do on the liver biopsy is take out a very small piece of worm-like tissue of the liver and that may not be representative of what is happening in the liver and sampling error is a potential bias which can occur in liver biopsy but otherwise liver biopsy is considered the gold standard though it may be a tarnished blood gold standard. And it is important to understand the fibrosis stage is a very important predictor of NFALD, NFALD mortality. And because of shortage of time, I will not go into those details. And uh, now coming back to the diagnosis of NFALD at various levels of healthcare, the first step is to identify patients who have in the community who are at high risk of developing NFALD so they, that they can be screened for uh, NFALD. And these patients are usually patients who have metabolic syndrome or who have diabetes and obese. And the second step is to diagnose NFLD. The best way to diagnose is to do an ultrasound, which is a very simple, safe, and uh, non-invasive technique widely available. And then also do a simple test of LFT and, uh, and uh, do a, a blood count and see the platelets and count and calculate the NFS uh, score or the FIP4 score to find out uh, whether the uh, NFLD is progressing to advanced fibrosis or not because advanced fibrosis is important because it helps in uh, prognosticating the patients and where who can and it is the presence of fibrosis which predicts very poor prognosis. The third step is risk stratification which involves identification of patients who are at risk of fibrosis and referral of these patients to of high risk to specialist care. Now let us come to some healthcare level setups in the community in the community level where we have basically uh, a &M or we have ASHA accredited social health activist or uh, in a primary health center where we have to assess the presence of risk factors and identify people who are at high risk at developing NFAID, especially those people who are obese, who have history, family history of diabetes who are family who are personal history of diabetes is present no no investigation just asking questions and looking at the patient not doing much of just looking at behavioral and not doing much of anthropometric uh, risk factors then at the community health centers we may have to do a lab testing like lft or complete blood count and do an ultrasonography when ultrasonography would detect 
the uh, fatty liver and then calculate with identify patients who are at high risk of fibrosis by calculating a very simple uh, fibrosis score or an NFS that is a NAFLD fibrosis score, very non-invasive techniques, widely it is available on the net. Just enter the figures and you get a score and uh, combining labs techniques and ultrasonography can be done at the community health center uh, to identify people who are at high risk of developing fibrosis so that they can be then subsequently referred to a district hospital to, uh, where they can go ahead with more advanced investigations like a transient elastography fibro scan, which is usually not available in a community health center or a liver biopsy, which is usually available in a tertiary care setting. And uh, so at a community level, we have the ASHA worker who identifies and refers patients with risk factors using a simple community-based assessment checklist and see for abdominal obesity, a waist circumference of more than 90 in men and more than 80 in female, 80 centimeters. And so lower cutoff levels in South Asians with a personal, that they have personally HP of diabetes or where there, there is a family HP of diabetes, hypertension, coronary heart disease, liver disease, gallstones or cancers. These are from the high risk group and they can be referred to a sub-center where a healthcare worker uh, would look at it. So looking at this again, identification of patients at high risk at the community level done by the ASHA worker who identifies high risk populations, they refers them to a sub-center level where a healthcare worker or a &M works works, validates the patients who are referred by ASHA and identifies again or high risk individuals and these high risk individuals are then subsequently referred to the primary health center or the health awareness uh, welfare center. and. Uh, where a medical officer is usually present, a doctor is usually present, where again validates these referral patients, identified high risk patients, identified patients with deranged LFTs and who have do have uh, who have incidental sciatosis on ultrasonogram. And then these high-risk patients are then referred to a community health center at a secondary care center where usually an ultrasound is present. And if there is a diagnosis of NFLD made, then they are then further risk stratified. If there is no NFLD, they're referred back to the community. And patient and secondary healthcare community health, we also do in addition to ultrasound, perform an LFT and do a complete blood count and then calculate the NFLT fibrosis score or the FIP score, which I just alluded in my previous slides, and then put the patients in these three buckets. One is at low risk of advanced fibrosis. These patients are referred back to the primary health center and then referred back uh, for treatment of their associated symptoms of or treat or associated comorbidities like diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and weight reduction, and then reassessed after three years. And those with intermediate risk and those with high risk of advanced fibrosis are referred to a, a tertiary care setting or to a medical college where their further evaluation is done and a fibro scan is performed in a, we do a transient elastography and which again, as I've alluded before in my previous slides, about patients can be classified into low risk of advanced fibrosis. These patients on a fibro scan with a score of less than eight kilo, uh, kilo pascals can be referred back to the PSC and reassessed after three years. But those who are at advanced risk of fibrosis patients are referred to a tertiary care setting. And in a tertiary care level, we need to do further evaluations and uh, where more sophisticated and advanced investigations may be available. And uh, especially in those who have hepatic uh, fibrosis, we may have to do again, fibro scan may be, is, may be repeated. May, we may have to confirm the level of fibrosis by in the liver by doing the uh, MR elastoscope, this magnetic resonance elastography, which is a better way of quantifying the amount of fibrosis in the liver. And in some selected patients, we may have to go ahead with the liver biopsy and then we, are, we may have to go have see whether the patient has developed cirrhosis and then evaluate the complications of cirrhosis, see whether the patient has developed portal hypertension and its complications and accordingly treat the patients there. And then screening for hepatocellular carcinoma is again a very important thing, which needs to be done, especially in this setup. And evaluation of associated comorbidities like of metabolic syndrome, like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia have to be addressed and treated. And uh, patients can be enrolled for clinical trials. We know now that uh, NFLD, unfortunately, there is no drug which has been approved for the treatment of NFLD, but, and the only treatment of NFLD is lifestyle modification, adopting a health lifestyle, which is 
conducive to uh, re reducing weight, the diet which causes reduced weight, increased uh, coffee consumption has been cons associated with uh, uh, with uh, improvement of the uh, NFLD. Then uh, consumption of diets which is rich in uh, nuts and almonds and cash cashew nuts. And uh, that, so there is a dietary uh, and less in uh, fatty food uh, have been shown to be useful. So weight reduction of nearly 10% has been shown to reduce the fat in the liver significantly and has been shown to be useful. But unfortunately, no drug has been approved for the treatment. And therefore, a lot of clinical trials are going on. We have vitamin E, which is an antioxidant, which is used in the dose of 800 milligrams uh, in patients of NFLD uh, for, and then uh, other drugs like uh, bioglitazone, which is an insulin sensitizer, and then we have other anti-anti-anti-diabetic anti medications which are under trial. Like we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, GLP-1 analogs uh, like Calira glutide when the lean study which has been shown to uh, be used for some sort of useful and then we have now a trial going on the semaglutide which is given once a week in patients of diabetes but these patients these drugs significantly reduce weight because they cause severe nausea and vomiting and therefore uh, helps in patients in reducing LFLD and certain other drugs are also under trial and uh, therefore a lot of clinical trials are then but as of now no drug ob2 colic acid has shown some lot of promise in treatment of NFLD unfortunately no drug has reached a stage that it has been approved by FDA for the treatment of NFLD and a lot of clinical trials are still going on the only treatment rests on lifestyle modification appropriate diet exercise weight reduction yoga good sleep is the only way in which this can be reversed. Uh, this is my last slide and thank you for a patient uh, hearing and that is all from my side. I'll stop sharing my slides. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much.